All right, welcome. This is Career Crossroads, navigating your next professional move with Diane Domeyer. Um, so a few quick housekeeping items. Um, you're welcome to take photos during the presentation. Of course, if you've been in here before, you know that these sessions are recorded. So any questions you ask, things like that, uh, will be recorded. And you can share your experience on social media. Make sure you use the hashtag UXPA2016. Um, and also, this is kind of a big room, so you don't have to move up, but if you would like to, uh, we would love it if everybody could kind of come up a little bit closer and, you know, get, get a little bit more engaged. So with that, I will welcome Diane Domeyer. Okay, hi, everybody. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Thank you so much. Um, yes, I'm Diane Domeyer, and uh, I am the executive director for the Creative Group. Um, TCG, the Creative Group, is a Robert Half company, and we work throughout North America to place and staff professionals in marketing, creative, digital um, positions. I have been with Robert Half for 25 years, um, and so I personally have worked with thousands of hiring managers and job seekers over that period of time. Um, I've seen many, many people at different career crossroads. Um, and so I'm very excited to talk to you about it today. Um, presumably if you're in the room, because there were other sessions as well, you may either be going through a career change or thinking about a career change, or you know of someone who is. Um, and I've always said generally, you know, and especially in our business, everyone is either looking for a job or knows someone is looking for a job, is hiring or knows someone who's hiring. And so one of our broader purposes, above and beyond providing staffing services, is being able to provide workplace and career trends and resources. So I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about that. But first of all, I have a question. Um, so if you were to guess what day of the week is most common for people to resign their positions, what would you say? Friday. Friday. Anybody else have another guess? Monday. Mondays, right? Why do you suppose it's Mondays? So it is actually Mondays. And so in my experience, both as a manager but also in our business, Monday is a very common day of resignation. And oftentimes it's because there's a lot of thought that goes into that over the weekend. But there are other times of year that also we see changes perking up for people. One is at year end or at the beginning of the year, over that holiday period of time. And then the other is oftentimes in the summer. And so in the summertime, in particular, post-vacation, and we're in you know, that period right now, heading into vacation season, it's a time to be very reflective. So as I thought about talking to all of you today about career crossroads, I thought certainly, and I will share with you, some perspective that we provide and research that we do as it relates to the, the landscape, the career landscape today. We do a lot of research about that. I'm going to share that with you. But I thought it would also be good to share a little bit about my own story um, because I think it's, you know, I've, I as well have gone through a number of career crossroads and many of you in the room probably have as well. So first of all, the Bureau of Labor Statistics states that by the age of 40, most people today have had 10 jobs. And the average is, over their lifetime, 12 to 15 jobs. So I'm no exception to that. However, I happen to do most of it within the same company. And so um, first of all, um, when I first graduated from college, I was definitely one of those people that had no idea what I wanted to be when I grew up. Absolutely none. So much so that I was triple major in college, uh, marketing, French, and accounting and finance. Um, on top of that, I had worked as a programmer all through college at 3M. Um, and then when I graduated, I thought, well, I'll do a little bit of international banking. Was bored, did that for six months. And then I thought, I think I should go into sales, and I sold photocopiers. So I had this really weird background with no direction of where I was going to go. And then I tried to sell a photocopier to Robert Half. And if you guys know of anyone who's a recruiter, you will generally find out that most people don't set out to say, I'm going to be a recruiter. But I fell into Robert Half, and they said, you know what? We need someone with accounting, finance, IT, and sales in their background. 
to be a recruiter, would you consider coming on board? So that was my first crossroads. So it was an unexpected, unanticipated career path and career journey, and those are out there. So I continued on with the organization, and you know, fortunately uh, was a part of some very successful teams. And so my next career crossroad was um, I had an opportunity to move from the Midwest to our corporate offices in California to head up a new division. Um, I was three months pregnant, and it required four days a week of travel for a very long time. And, up, and I was also fairly newly married, but it was an opportunity. And so I picked up my family, and we moved to California. That was a big career crossroads that led to opportunity, but also came with significant sacrifice. Several years after that, my next career crossroads of significance was I was now pregnant with my third child, and four days of travel was getting a little rough on the home life, my husband in particular. He could do ponytails with the best of them, but there were a lot of other things he needed help with. And I said, you know what? This was in the age of the internet boom, and we as a staffing company had to respond to job boards being launched, and what would that mean for a recruiting strategy? We had to build websites that were more than marketing and brochureware. And I had a little bit of IT background, a little bit of marketing, and we didn't have anyone to be the business arm of IT. So I raised my hand and I asked our CFO if I could do that job, and I wrote my job description. And so for a period of about five years, I was the business arm of IT, necessitated by opportunity as well as personal challenges. So that was another significant career move for me. You know, the next was now my most recent, going back three years ago. Uh, we had an opening for the creative group, which I now manage throughout North America, and it was the perfect blend of accounting, I'm sorry, not accounting, marketing, IT, and digital strategy that I had done for the organization, but I loved the sales and operations channel. And so we kind of mutually said I should do that job. And so. I share that story with you because you all have your own personal stories, right? You all have had different career crossroads that have gotten you to this point and perhaps what's next for you. But there are different motivations for these crossroads, right? Sometimes we face opportunities that are unforeseen or we hadn't, hadn't anticipated, and we need to think about those. Other times we have to balance the needs of our family or other influences. And then there are other times where it's just an obvious next step. So regardless of what that is, what we want to share with you today is I'm going to start with just a little bit of background about what's happening in the industry. Then we're going to share common crossroads, and I'm going to ask two very tenured UX professionals to come in and share their personal experiences through those crossroads. And then, under the assumption that maybe you're here because you've been thinking about or at that point yourself, I'm going to give you a little bit of personal reflection to determine what your next goals may be. So that's what we're going to accomplish in the next 50 minutes. So, so let's talk about what's next. And now my clicker's not working. Hold on here. It was. I was afraid that was going to happen. All right. Well, I'll do it this way. Good old-fashioned way. There we go. What is happening in the landscape? So we do research every year. This is a part of the research that we did for our 2016 salary guide, primarily in the fields of marketing, creative, digital, and design. And there are five trends that are impacting hiring today. Number one, job seekers are in command. So all of you probably are fully aware the economic environment has improved significantly. The unemployment rate has dropped to 5%. The unemployment rate for college degreed workers in the US as of April was 2.4%. So the unemployment rate is significantly low. For designers, it's also prim um, particularly lower than the 5%, but it's 3.3%. So with that, there is increasing demand, improving economy, and within the unemployed pool, much lower available talent within the sector that all of you are in. So that bodes well for career opportunities. One of the trends that we see in, tr in specific demand in our business is digital reign supreme. So not only you know, design, marketing, creative, 
But the digital part of our business is growing significantly, and our business is driven by way, where people are hiring. So in particular, in design, responsive design, mobile design, but even social media content strategy. So most of your organizations are thinking about that, and so that, those are opportunities that are particularly short in supply. And as a matter of fact, when, with our research, 60%, 58% of the hiring managers that we surveyed said that it is difficult to find the talent that they're looking for, which is the highest that it's been since 2010. So I'm kind of painting a picture of hopefully if you are at a career crossroads, the opportunities are plentiful for job seekers. Um, I did a search on our website of how many open positions we have posted for UX, and it was 1,100 throughout North America. So there's, there's big opportunities. With that, companies are concerned about hiring, attracting, and retaining top talent. And so with that, it's not just about increasing compensation, but companies are focusing on providing learning and development and mentorship programs, both to keep their talent, but also to sharpen the skills of those that may not come to the table with all the skills to begin with, given the shortage of talent. On top of that, marketing budgets are increasing in organizations, and so hiring is up. So full-time, contract to hire, but also project professionals, both freelance as well as projects, is organizations are looking to the freelance pool to supplement the skills that they're having a hard time finding in their existing team or that they just don't have enough of. So those are some of the trends. With that, compensation is increasing. So, We've published the salary guide for the last 17 years, and we've seen the greatest number of increases that we've seen in quite some time, certainly since before 2008. But overall salaries are expected to rise in 2016, starting salaries not including bonus and everything else, 3.8%. For interactive and digital jobs, it's higher. And then you can see, and we just pulled a couple of where in the UX field, those types of opportunities that are increasing even more so than average. But it's not all about compensation, right? Compensation, we also see the companies are doing that to retain top talent. But you know, there's, there's a huge demand in certain skill areas. We've touched on some of these as well. And it, it, granted, it may go broader than just the field of UX. But in that area, clearly the technical skills are in demand. A lot of discussion around customer experience and user experience, not necessarily synonymous, but user experience and customer experience through all touch points of an organization. Not just their digital products or their products, uh, but it's everywhere from improved customer experience from the very first touch point of acquisition through to retention. Key differentiators of who gets the job are soft skills. And when we survey hiring managers, they say in general that that is one area, especially for those that are coming into the workforce, that they have a hard time finding those that are really, really strong in oral, written and verbal communication, um, teamwork abilities, et cetera. Since more and more organizations have cross-functional teams versus siloed teams, those soft skills are really, really important. OK, some of the positions that we find our clients call to us more and more because they're really having a hard time finding the talent are in these areas. Um, so some of these not necessarily surprising to you, most likely. Um, but you know, one that I would kind of highlight is creative technologist is really, and there's all kinds of different titles that are emerging relative to those that are bringing marketing, creative, and technology together that have an aptitude on both sides. So those are some of the most in-demand positions. So when we find that people are at a career crossroads and people are thinking about making a change, what would anyone guess is the most common reason that someone leaves a job or decides to resign? Anyone want to take a guess? Just make sure you're awake. Yes. Better job. Better job. And what would define that better job? Yeah, so what I love about what you just said is 
What I find terrific is that you didn't even talk about higher compensation until you talked about the work environment or the ability to move forward, et cetera. Compensation is a consideration, but the top five reasons that people leave a job is number one, environment, unhappiness, unhappiness with their manager. Most common response. Second is limited advancement opportunities, the ability to move your career forward, followed by lack of rec recognition, followed by salary. So as we consult to hiring managers who are looking to attract and retain top talent, we talk to them about how important it is that compensation be in line with market, but you must first address the other opportunities because that's what retains top talent. But compensation is definitely a consideration. It's one of the top five, but environment ranks at the top of the list. So with that, that's a little bit of the background, some of the trends you can see in terms of the hiring landscape is very positive. So if you are personally in a career crossroads, it's a good time, and especially in the profession that you're in. Um, what I have up here are some of the most common crossroads or decisions that people need to make when they're in those crossroads, and we're gonna share some experiences relative to those. Do I pursue a promotion? Am I interested in a promotion? Am I eligible for a promotion? Should I go in a different direction entirely and leave my company, stay in my niche, but find a job elsewhere? Might I consider switching disciplines, doing something maybe related, but pretty different than what I'm doing now? Or should I consider striking out on my own? And so I have two guests with me today who are very experienced UX professionals who have faced each of these crossroads in their careers, and I'd love to share their personal stories. So I'm gonna to invite to the stage Chris Haas, which many of you know, uh, very actively involved in UXPA, as well as Randy Kincaid from, from Blue Cross, and hopefully we're mic'd up and ready to go. So to we're show? gonna have a seat, make yourselves comfortable. Hey, everybody. Hello. So we're gonna test the mic, we good? Okay. Yeah, sounds all right. So Chris, yep, works. you okay. get to go first. Oh my gosh. Uh, Chris Haas, I'm a senior VP of experience design at the experience design agency Mad Pal. Um, I've had an interesting path. I think I'm a poster child for um, the, how you find your way into the career by accident. And so I have an undergraduate degree in English and I'm the son of two uh, college professors. So I always assumed I would be a, an English professor. And so while I was trying to sort out my graduate school opportunities, um, I fell into uh, a nonprofit, ended up co-running a national youth network for violence prevention among pr uh, practitioners, and um, then ended up catching the web wave, and then ended up through a series of, of companies and, and following sort of the muse of where that would lead me, realized that I'm, I'm a person who really likes sitting at the crossroads. I really like being able to speak to business people and marketers and technologists and I like coding and I like drawing and I like graphic design and I'm sort of not good at any of them enough to, to have really, or wouldn't have been happy pursuing any one of them sort of full on. And so um, I was, we were saying earlier, I, I wake up every morning uh, very thankful that I have a job because I feel like I'm sort of uh, jack of all trades, master of none. So I, I hope to be proof of, you know, some folks, uh, there really weren't degree programs in this when I was uh, looking at, at, into what I wanted to do and be when I grow up. And fortunately, I think I lead a career where I, I haven't yet had to grow up. So um, I'm happy to talk to that at you know, whatever length uh, is appropriate. So. Uh, You're pretty grown up to me, but you certainly have fun in life, that's for sure. <laughs> certainly, John. Well, look at these guys. I mean, how can you not? So. Randy. Thank you, Diane. Randy Kincaid, I'm a founder of a company I started three years ago, Reverbent. And small correction, I'm currently on assignment at Blue Shield. Did I say it wrong you said again? Blue Cross, but don't worry about it. Oh. <laughs> it's okay. And interestingly, all my life, Diane talked a little bit about not sure where her focus was. My focus was always around art and drawing. So I would just draw endlessly. And of course, going through school, you have to suddenly figure out career. And so I thought, well, what career could I you know, apply with my drawing and my interest in art? So I was mentored along the way uh, with a very uh, thoughtful high school art teacher who steered me in the right direction. I ended up getting my degree in graphic design from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Upon graduation, worked in various uh, small startup companies in the capacity of, at that time, a print graphic designer. And then talking about catching the, the web or the internet wave, that showed up. And so then tried to understand how I could transfer my print and drawing and art skills over to the digital realm. So ended up doing a lot of instructional design, computer-based learning, things of that nature. 
and then transitioned more to UI work and held numerous roles throughout my career that sort of danced around the digital realm. So I've been a business analyst, I've been a front end developer, I've been a visual designer, I've been uh, an interaction designer, and now I'm an entrepreneur. So <laughs> I've kind of danced around all these things, but it's been a great journey, mm -hmm. I'm just trying That's to exciting. have fun. How many of you would say that in your careers to this point, you as well have held, have worn many different hats in professions? Yeah, so I know we got a little bit of that as we started. And so my guess is not just Chris and Randy, but many of you in the room have faced different crossroads as well. Um, and so we're going to talk about how do you navigate through those a little bit. And so I put up the four most common um, crossroads that you face. And some of you may be thinking, you know what, that my next logical step is some type of a promotion, right? So I either need to, when that promotion may be managing people, uh, it may be more responsibility, it may be sitting higher on the org chart. And so with that, you know, there's a couple of things that if you are at that point that you should consider. And number one is put yourself first and foremost in the shoes of your manager. Right? So before, there's one thing which is I want to apply for a promotion or I think I'm ready for a promotion. But what is your manager or the person that that would report to? What is their perception of you? Right? And they're going to ask these questions. Do you have the aptitude? You know, in other words, do you have the capability, the knowledge that is necessary to do the job? But that's a baseline question. The next is do you have the capacity? Can you demonstrate that you have the bandwidth to take on more responsibility? Can you deliver, of course, quality work? But also, how are you to work with? Can you give and take direction? Are you considered high maintenance? Right. So those are the questions that your manager may be asking or the person that supervises that role. But you also have to ask yourself, like, why do you want to do that? Right? What is your key motivator? And so, Randy, I'm going to ask you this question um, because I know that in your professional career, you know, and especially on the BA, but then also managing a UX team, right? So you've gone at different times from contributor to manager. Right. But I think you also have an interesting perspective of then moving out of management. Right. You know, and what were your considerations at that time? It, it was challenging in certain respects, primarily because as a result of the lack of advocacy above me. And so it made my ability to manage my team more difficult. So given those tumultuous times at that particular job, it made more sense for me to come back down as more of an individual contributor, where I felt like I could drive more job satisfaction, uh -huh. right? It wasn't, again, it wasn't so much about salary or any of those other things. It was more about when I'm in a manager role, I want to be able to empower my team, but I can only empower my team to the extent that my superiors empower me. And so when that's gone or when that's taken away, it made the job not that fun any longer. So it made sense at that time to come back down as an individual contributor. Yeah. So it takes a fair amount of self-reflection yeah. as it relates to what do I really want to do, right. and am I in a position of empowerment, right. right? Right. You had told me about a model What we talked about on the phone. What oh, was that? the corporate maturity model. Uh -huh. Is that what you're referring to? Right. This idea that every company, no matter what company you would look at, has a corporate maturity model. And that is to say, where is this company in terms of their maturity, generally, and also within specific departments, right? So you could look at HR, you could look at user experience groups, you could look at accounting, finance, any group, and understand where are they on that graph of maturity. So an example I would think of in, in certain situations I've encountered with a UX maturity model at a company, you would come in and during the interviewing process, you may not ask deep enough questions to assess the model accurately. So they interview you, but you fail to interview them. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine, you get the job, you come in, and your expectations are somehow not on par with the reality around you. So for example, you may come in and say, my expectation is I'll have the newest hardware, and I'll have the newest software, and I'll be able to have access to a budget and to vendors that can help me in my user experience tasks and, and projects, only to find that when you're there, there's no budget, there's no hardware, mm -hmm. and there's no current software, because their level of maturity in that department is not as advanced as you would have hoped. So now you're at, a, at somewhat of a career crossroads because you have to now decide, do I try and effect change where I am and, and move them forward on that continuum or is it too difficult, it's a non-starter and I need to remove myself from this situation 
and go to a company that's further along on that continuum. Yep. And so while that may make sense from the standpoint of, you know, I'm making a job change, what company's right for me, but presumably that same model can work when you're talking about pursuing a promotion, right? Correct. Like the, the, the maturity model and what do you need to do to be successful in that management role right. and whether it's going to drive your personal satisfaction. A quick, just a quick anecdote on that. We, at a company that I was, that I was managing, a staff, we had content strategists. We got our funding cut and we were no longer able to expand that group. So of course we had the, the, the dilemma of losing headcount. I had people leave. A gal that I mentored a little bit, she went and she interviewed around. I bumped into her later. She said, oh, I'm having an interview at Wells Fargo. I said, great. She says, I'm so excited. I'm meeting with the VP of content strategy. And I said, well, that right there should tell you they're much further along on that maturity model than we ever were at, our, at the job she just left. We didn't have a VP of content strategy. We didn't even have a VP of user experience. Mm -hmm. And so I said to her, just that right there shows that they value the role enough to position it at a VP level, which shows you they're further along on that continuum of that maturity model. And some people really want to be the pioneers to make the change, Correct. and others want to be where they're already supported to do it. Right. Now, Chris, you, you know, as it relates to kind of your looking back at your career, I know we had some discussions about there was times where you felt like maybe you were roadblocked from moving forward. So you want to talk about that from sure. promotion standpoint? Well, I think some of the questions that I would ask myself and have asked myself is, am I growing? Am I, am I still learning? Are there more things for me to do here? Is my contribution complete? Um, is it worth it to my manager or, or to promote me? Uh, right. you know, is it worth the administrative headache for them to, to do it? What's in it for them? How can I make it worthwhile to them? Or, or how can I move on? I, I think American businesses, in particular big ones, have a really bad habit of bringing in particularly young talent and, and just sucking them dry like vampires. You know, get, we'll get every hour out of you we can. And then at about two or three years of experience, when you are fully versed and useful and, and know everything you need to know about what you've been asked to do, you ask for that promotion and very often they'll say, ah, we'll just get somebody younger, you know, go somewhere else. And so I've certainly, I hate that. It drives me amazingly crazy. I, I get very upset at that and I think it's a terrible thing to, to sharpen up everybody and make them useful and then basically drive them somewhere mm -hmm. else. Mm -hmm. And so when, when you start hitting some of those walls to say, you know, if you, if you spend more time psychoanalyzing your boss or the politics around you than you do doing your job, then it's probably time mm -hmm. to go. Life yeah. is far too short for bad bosses. Mm -hmm. And having a good boss can make all the difference in either stepping back and letting you do it or mentoring you into new things or championing you to the rest of the company to say, this person is amazing and really helpful in these ways. But also being realistic about what am I contributing? You know, Am I a nine to fiver? Am I there above and beyond? But I also think that good people stay in bad jobs longer because they think, if I just push hard enough or I can solve this problem, and they're, they're applying all of this energy to, to working the system and not realizing, you know what, maybe the best place to be is elsewhere because companies like that, I, I, hate, I hate to say, but you, you tend to leave and then even if they bring you back, you get the promotion that you wanted because now you have more experience because you've been outside is an old truism, but it actually, it, it tends it to work, happen. it happens. Mm -hmm. So yeah. um, I think for me, I've been very lucky. So coming out of college, went into um, nonprofit work, uh, caught the web wave and started working for Harvard Medical School, making websites and, and trying to figure out how technology could be useful to advance medical science. And so that led me to figuring out that HCI was a field and human factors was a field and, and getting more interested in that and took a class to, at night on my own on interface design that the, where the professor said, at the end of this course, somebody's gonna really impress the hell out of me and I'm gonna hire that person. And I thought, I want that to be me. And I gave my all and it turned out it was me uh, at the end of the course and that led to uh, you know, full on work in the field as a, as a practitioner, a UX researcher, a designer. Um, and so for me, I wasn't I was really surprised 10 years later to realize I had a career because uh, I was just doing things. I was following a learning line of things that I was interested in and, and turned out to be good at and were helpful and looking for people who were as inspired and as inspiring as, as I wanted to be and, um, and got very lucky in, in being able to find those opportunities. But I think if you have a learning line that you're following, that makes it a lot easier because it's not so much about salary or this company or the nice desk. It's about doing what you love and being good at it. Yeah. Um, 
And I, I made a mistake, I, I, not a mistake, I've, I've gone through that into the other side of being a practitioner and then it turned out I had a, a propensity for business development. And so for promotion for me, um, you know, a company will never really be mean to you if you're bringing them money. <laughs> so doing business development and being able to be an advocate for sales and for UX and, and understanding the research, putting together proposals and contracts um, is now what I'm doing primarily in my day job. So I get less day-to-day -day practice but it's still pretty exciting to, to keep my hand in on what new challenges can we face and where can we go. Mm -hmm. um, well, and so a very common trend is determining what, your, what you personally value, what derives your satisfaction, and how does your current situation you know, measure up against that. And so borrowing Randy's you know, kind of corporate maturity model, if you are at a point where you feel like promotion is the crossroads that makes sense for you, a couple of things to consider. First of all, take your career into your own hands. And if your current organization provides for you the environment and the uh, philosophy that matches your personal goals, first of all, look within. But you've got to make a, a case for why you would, should be considered for that promotion. In other words, don't wait for it to open and don't wait for your performance review. Um, Set a meeting with your supervisor or key influencer to educate them on the fact that you feel you're ready for the next step. But it's not just about setting a meeting. It's not about just asking for the promotion immediately. It's making a plan. So first of all, you need to make a strong business case as to why you're ready. So what I find is a lot of people assume that even if they've worked with a manager for a long time, that that manager knows everything that they've done. And the reality is, sometimes they need a reminder. Like you need to make a strong business case for what have been your accomplishments since you've been there. Because people have short memories. I didn't remember you used to work for Celeste Young. I totally forgot about that, <laughs> right? So, so you make a strong case. You make your intentions clear that you'd like to take on more responsibility, either in the form of a promotion, but if there's no promotion available, what can you do now to demonstrate your readiness to do more? Um, ask for feedback about what technical and soft skills you need to improve upon to be ready for that next step. And especially in an environment where unemployment rates are low, most organizations, maybe not every manager, but most organizations realize that they need to have these career discussions in order to retain people and see the light at the end of the tunnel. So just a couple of things as it relates to promotion. Can I add a note to that? Yeah. I would also say be aware of what, I hate to say what turns you on, but like what, what are you after? So for example, I've had colleagues where they were in an interesting job, they're being well paid, but they don't have that title that they really wanted. And, and over the years, the title's been the same, but, and the responsibility's gotten greater and the work's gotten more interesting, but not having that title really grates versus I really want more money and money is really important to me or I want more time off or I want more, whatever it may be, more opportunity, more autonomy. The old school way of, of doing business was you, you would be a really great practitioner and then they would make you a manager and then you would rise or sink on your soft skills that no one had ever taught you because you were a practitioner, not a manager. And so I think a, a better way that I've seen people be more happy in is to go from being a practitioner to being a practitioner on more interesting, broader, bigger right. projects, more right. risk, more, more importance. Um, so if you can go into it saying, you know what, maybe money is impossible, but I don't really mind the money so much, I just really want whatever it may be, mm -hmm. more autonomy, as someone to help me with this part so I can do more of that part, Let, let's talk about that. Oftentimes you can really open up a negotiation well by, by just making sure you're clear on, you know, it's not just, oh, promote me and then good things will happen. What specifically am I looking for? Mm -hmm. That might make a huge difference in helping a good manager help you get the right promotion in whatever system you're in. You know, Chris, hearing you say that makes me think, you talked about having like a learning line for your career, right? And so this, this phrase comes to mind that I thought of when you said this, that if you stand for nothing, you'll fall for anything, right? And so if you don't have clear goals and objectives about your career, right. it'll wander, yep. right? Yep. Yeah. And if you do have clear goals and you know what you want to do and your, your current role is not giving that to you and you've explored with your current organization how you might make a change, sometimes you just have to make a shift to go elsewhere. And so, you know, Chris talked a little bit about you know, sometimes you need to leave to get that next opportunity. So if you're in that position, a couple of just very basic tips, but things to think about is, of course, um, look at your social media presence, your digital portfolio, 
look at your LinkedIn profile. 68% of hiring managers review LinkedIn profiles now, in some cases before they even see your resume, right? So make sure that you've not only have your resume and your portfolio ready, but that you've got your social media presence beefed up as well. Um, so this is significantly different than when I got into recruitment where everybody had a faxed resume, right? So beef up your linked profile. Um, but also make sure that when you pull something together, whether it's through networking or applying to a job, that you create a unique customer experience by tailoring your application materials to the job, right? And with that, one of the biggest um, things that I see people leaving off is they don't demonstrate their value on their resume or their LinkedIn enough. You do need to brag a bit about what your contributions are. Your technical skills in and of themselves and your experience is not enough. What was your contribution to the company? Demonstrate your value and of course play up whatever technical skills. Uh, but if you can demonstrate your value or contributions in your career, that will also help to play up your soft skills. Um, companies are looking at what's your involvement at UXPA or elsewhere. What do you do to pursue your passion on the side? Um, and so that says a lot about you. So another career crossroad is completely switching disciplines. And so, you know, I think to, I mean, both of you have examples. So Chris, you went from, you know, practitioner and then in a variety of different industries, but to biz dev. And then Randy, you know, from design to IT to business analyst. So I don't know if either of one of you want to talk about lessons learned having done that, both on the positive as well as challenges. Well, certainly a piece of advice I would recommend. I, um, there are so many smart people in this room and in the world and doing interesting things. And I am a huge fan of snuggle up to the people who are smarter than you and know more than you, or doing the thing that you want to do. Thanks. Uh, so <laughs> That's why I'm here next to Randy um, and Diane. Um, so a, a good example would be um, years ago, I was doing web, uh, web coding and interface design and needed to know about accessibility. Suddenly it was coming up again and again, and I didn't know anything about it. So I called the World Wide Web Consortium's Web Accessibility Initiative and said, hey, what is this about? And they said, oh, well, we'll be glad to talk to you. And fortunately, they were down the road in MIT for a meeting, and I showed up, and we talked, and they were really friendly and pleasant. And I, I told them what I did and, and the usability testing work I was doing, and they said, oh, well, we have this website that we're working on to, to put the Web 2.0 requirements out, maybe you could help us a little bit with that. And I went back and I begged my boss for some time and some freedom to give them a half a usability test for free on the weekends of my own time. And so everybody came and we used our lab and gave a test of their, their stuff. I think it was four people. And they were absolutely stunned and went out and found more funding and came back and did the rest of it. And we ended up helping them to redesign it and it led to all these good things. And it led to also me having someone to tutor me in accessibility and web accessibility and what was important there and what the standards were. I learned a lot. And um, the, my second part of that is uh, be, be shameless because if you find the people that know more and you can be helpful to them and you can find a way to learn from them. Um, internally, I started, I needed some time on my timesheet. We did timesheets in every 15 minute increments. And I needed to be able to justify thinking about accessibility in a way that nobody had given me permission for. So I put down accessibility initiative on my timeline, on my timesheet. And so for you know, a couple of weeks went by and I would think about it for two hours a week or so and incorporate it into my work. And it turned out that, that at the sea level of the company, a couple of months later, uh, somebody said, hey, what do we know about accessibility? We've got this grant opportunity. We need to deal with accessibility. And somebody said, well, somebody who had been reading the timesheets said, well, Haas has an initiative. <laughs> and, and so they called me up and they said, Chris, this, you have a, I need to talk to you about your accessibility initiative. Hop on a plane, join me in DC, and give a two-hour presentation to the C-suite of the company about what we need to know about accessibility. I want to hear what this initiative has done. And I thought, oh, shit. You quickly <laughs> became an expert. <laughs> Suddenly, I was an expert. And so I boned up as much as I could. I gave a good presentation. And all of a sudden, I was the focal point for the company on anything accessibility related. And it came because... I just made up an initiative, and so right. uh, I did. Fortunately, I didn't get you know fired. There was no budget or anything, so I wasn't doing anything really terrible. But um, but be a bit shameless, you know. Call it something, and it will become something. Just like envisioning what your future might be. Right. If you can give it a name, then it helps you to find steps towards it. And and I think when you talk about mm -hmm. having a big plan, you know, there are people who can say these are this is exactly what I'm going to do into infinity to get there. But you can also say that is a really shiny object, or I really love how much fun those people are having while they're doing it. How can I help them do more of it and see if maybe I like that too? 
and that's been a, a, a nice through line for my, my career. So One of my favorite lines is from a movie, I think it's a Disney or Pixar movie called Robots, and it was see a need, fill a need. Like, if you see a need, you fill a need, you add value to the organization, and before you know it, you wrote your own job description. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, Randy, I think about the time where you mentioned that you had to go backwards in your career to learn a new skill, and I don't know if that was business analyst role or something, but you had to learn a new skill and make a change. Right, and that? following along in your previous slide about making a case, and then Chris's concept of you know, asking, you know, just exploring. I, I switched disciplines and I didn't even know it, mm -hmm. right? Because I was more interested in just exploring more about the, the roles and the components around the projects and the items we were delivering. So I ended up going from visual design into business analysis as a business analyst, mm -hmm. not knowing that I completely switched disciplines. I was just trying to find out what happens further upstream from like a project requirements and documentation standpoint, because we kept getting all this information downstream as UI UX designers. And so I explored there. And then there wasn't really an opening, but you made, I made a case and they said, okay, sure, you want to do this. I didn't know I was switching disciplines. I just wanted to explore more. And so you talk about being shameful or you know, shameless, I should say, you just go in and you just do it and you ask. Several years after that, I pivoted again and then jumped over to another team where the, the director actually had to make up the role for me because I went to him and said, I want to know how did this stuff gets built. So I wanted to learn more about the coding. And I don't think that these things would have happened had I not been curious to want to do them, but also to be able to make the case, to tie it together, to show not just personal value and, and gain for me, but gain for the company as well by sharpening my skills, which is what you talked about in your previous slide there. And then finally coming back around to then more of the design aspects of it. So I kind of felt like I'd taken this journey, not fully aware that I was taking a journey. Mm -hmm. I was just exploring and then I, I realized later, oh, I was on sort of a learning line and now I feel like I had built up all of these skills that created this ability to not only have better empathy for my teammates, right, for all the people involved in these projects, but also to understand the challenges they face. Right, so you were very close into the business, to marketing, to yes. the technology team, right. et cetera. And that is, the more you can have that and, and seek out those opportunities. I think one of the lessons and kind of threads that I'm hearing in both of your commentary is, of course, the personal reflection of, you know, what turns you on. <laughs> but second of all, that just because you don't see the opportunity doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Right. And so always explore those right. opportunities. So, you know, in some cases, you may be at a point where you say, you know what, I'm at a point in my career where maybe I want to do my own thing, right? So, um, and, you know, three possible ways you may go is I want to become a freelancer. Um, or I want to start my own, I want to be an entrepreneur and I want to start my own business, a full-fledged business from scratch. Um, or I'm not sure I want to, you know, completely make my own way and I might want to strike out on my own and get some help with like a staffing agency. So you guys have done all, both if not all of these, I think, in your career. Yeah, and so, yeah. <laughs> so well, I don't know so if you, either of you want to start with kind of lessons like what you had to factor in and, and what you learned through that process. I think, so, correct, I've done all three of these actually, and currently now find myself, you know, breaking out and, and running a full-fledged business. Three years ago, a, a great personal friend and business partner of mine, we started Reverbent, and it's an IT and design consulting uh, agency, and we basically, I feel fortunate that I get to now own a company that practices what I had been practicing all along, and the motivation for me really is the ability to not just own more of my time, but also to own more of my career, right? As opposed to sort of my career owning me. I probably want to kind of like flip the tables. I, I still work as many hours, if not more. And, but it's, it's more from the aspect that I feel like the time had come that I had done so many of these different roles and been exposed to so many things that I finally one day woke up and realized, I, I think I can do this. And so I was willing to take that, that risk and, and step out and do that. And I think for me, I was obviously at a career crossroads, and I solved it in this particular way by starting my own company. The challenges, I think, you talked about some of the, the specific hurdles you face, and, I, and Chris and I were talking about this earlier, is the timing never seems right. 
And I think back to that, that dilemma when, when new couples face about when, 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 she, when, when should we have time. kids. Mm -hmm. And so when, well, we'll do it when, we have the, when it's the right time and you come to realize there's never the right time, you just have to do it. And that's kind of the same thing I think with any of these particular choices on screen here. You just have to come to the point in your career where, as you say, you're just not gonna stay there any longer and you're gonna make the jump. I, I, I have these quotes, I heard another quote uh, said, the only reason fear exists is to be conquered. And so I, I, I know it's trite and it's easy to say, but I really truly believe it, right? Is that it just, the, you put one foot in front of the other foot and you just go and you do it. And when you have a goal and you apply yourself toward that goal, you'll be amazed at what you can achieve. I'll end with the idea that, that we even motivate ourselves at Reverbent. We have a sign above our door when we walk in every day and it says, what one thing am I going to do today to advance this company? And so I think you could just put in whatever you want at the end of it, advance my career, advance my skills, advance my company, but what one thing will you do today to fill in your blank? So. It's funny you Great say that. I have, I have a plaque in my office that says, what good shall I do this day? There you are. And, I, nice. and that's, I think, an important thing to think about, too, is for me, it's been very important to have meaningful work. Right. I, I don't want to just get out of bed and sell widgets in the morning. I want to make a difference or feel like I'm making a difference or working towards making a difference. And so for me, I've done freelancing. Um, I had a quick attempt at a web business, just me, and uh, realized that that, that wasn't going to work, and I've worked with staffing agencies. Um, so for me, I, I've always liked having a stable place to stand, and so I've worked with agencies and, and groups that do consulting, but if I had a bad month, I still had a job versus being like a total freelancer where, mm -hmm. you know, it, you live, you're living paycheck to paycheck a bit more. And so I think being realistic about what does it really take to do the self-employment side is, is very important because, so I, we have a consultant that we work with who's brilliant and we send him into these, these incredible top tier companies and he just moves mountains and does amazing work in about six months and then he goes, you know what, I've done what I need to do. I'm gonna go to Thailand for a couple of months. I will call you guys when I'm out again. And he disappears and I think, man, I would love that guy, be that guy, <laughs> right? Like, let me just go to Bali for a few months and hang out. But he's made that choice to sacrifice certain things but he's also very good at business development. And I think keeping yourself employed, particularly as a consultant, is often more about biz dev than it can be about the work. You have to be able to do both and do it really, really well. And so suddenly you can find yourself throwing out a shingle and realizing, I really hate drumming up business or I really hate or I have no time to do this because I'm always sowing the seeds of where's my next thing gonna come because you don't have an organization really working to help you with that. And that can be exhilarating but it also can be very sobering, I think. Mm -hmm. so, so just when you're making those decisions, some of it can just be, what's the best platform for me to pursue what I really love to do and maybe downshift on the stuff that, that's maybe not my forte or not so interesting yeah. um, can be helpful. Good comments. Great. Okay, so now I'm gonna ask all of you uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, playing along a little bit um, under the assumption that maybe you're here because you wanna know how to navigate some of these things. I want to ask you to do a little bit of self-reflection. So first of all, I want you to ask yourself and answer these questions. You can write them down, you can say them in your head, whatever. I'll, I'll know I've arrived when. I get to sit next to Randy. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And the perfect work day would entail. So just top of mind. Okay, so as you look at that, the answer to the first one is a little bit more of what we would call a prestige response. In other words, it may be a definition of success, it may be a definition of how I'm perceived, it may be outward looking in. The, the latter is your everyday response, meaning what do you get really jazzed about? And so while they're both important, the second drives a little bit more personal satisfaction. And so with that, if you have, if you are at a point where you feel like you need to make a change, the next thing I want you to do is to write down your next career goal. This is just for you. What is your career goal? And we'll give you a minute to write that down. I see some to take a nap later today. Mm -hmm. in the end. 
So if it's a goal, there's terrific power in writing it down. So you need to write it down. Yeah, and writing it down allows you to revisit it mm -hmm. and to check it. Mm -hmm. And to have other people hold you accountable. Yeah, that's right. So what comes to mind first is what you will write down top of mind, but sometimes your goals need refinement. And so one technique that we use when talking to people about their next career move is we have them do the five whys. Five whys in order to get to the root of what you're looking for in your next career opportunity. So this is just an example. I want to move from my in-house job to a more creative agency job. Why do you want to work at an agency? Why do you want to be more creative? Why do you want to do more interesting work? Why do you want to be a more interesting person? Why do you want to find others? Why do you want others to find you and your work interesting? So it gets to your true motivators. So we're a little short on time, so I'm not going to have you guys do that now. Um, but I think that's a very good exercise. If you take that goal and you ask five whys, you will find that you'll get at the root of your motivations, which will help you to crystallize your goal a little bit more. Okay. So, um, so with that, here's a couple of additional considerations for you. And the, the presentation will be available afterwards as well. But when you're thinking about what your next career opportunity may be, again, thinking of the everyday response versus the prestige response, right? So I've known so many people over the years that their natural next step is to move to this level. It's just what's next on the career ladder. And then they get to that point and it's like, oh, it's not really what I wanted to do. I wasn't really sure I wanted to manage people. I just wanted the title. Um, so or whatever that may be, right, you need to consider how much freedom, what does freedom look like to you? How much decision-making authority do you want? Some people are outstanding executors, but they don't want to be the ones leading strategy. They like to execute. You know, you want to be the ones making decisions or you want to be the one executing on decisions. Do you want to manage people, yes or no? One's not better than the other and one is not more important. How important is structure in your current department? Would you rather work for a large or small company, different environments? So again, it gets to the environmental factors that we talked about as to why people leave jobs. Consider what is the ideal environment for you. Personal time, and then a really big question, what sacrifices are you willing to make, right? Because you may need to sacrifice compensation. You may need to sacrifice commute time. You may need to sacrifice lifestyle for a period of time. So it's a very important question to ask is what sacrifices are you willing to make? So with that, I'm going to kind of jump ahead. If you set your goal, it's important. You guys have probably all seen this before. But refine your goal. Is it specific? Do you have an action plan that's measurable? Is it attainable? Is it within reality? And then do you have a time bound? So if you've set a career goal, and if you've written one down, Chances are, if you do the five whys, it might require further reflection. And it might require you know, revisiting to make sure that it's smart and you know, time bound. But you also want to share that goal. So Randy said there's tremendous power in writing it down. But it's also share the goal, post the goal, talk to your mentor, talk to others, talk to your family. Because there's something to be said for, am I on the path to achieving that goal? Um, so post it, share it. Um, but you will probably hit roadblocks. Whatever that career goal may be, it is absolutely not you know, unheard of that you're going to hit roadblocks. So consider detours, but not dead ends. In other words, whatever that final question is on the five whys as to your motivation and what you're really looking for, if you start to look at something that is a dead end to achieving that, you know, oftentimes people stay there because they're chosen out of fear. They, you know, they stay in a job too long because they're not sure what's next, you know, but think about the dead ends and dead ends will make you feel compromised, but you may hit detours. You may need to go completely in a different direction. You know what you're looking for and then a career opportunity is presented to you that you had never even considered before. The, so those detours will maybe take you off the path, but they're chosen out of interest, they align with your core values, and they might be prompted by industry trends and changes. And I think we heard some of those examples in both Chris's career path as well as Randy's. Um, and so you know, keep your ear open to those detours because you're never 
you know, never really sure where they may take you. So Chris, go ahead. Just I had one last thing to say. I, I think I can't stress enough that how helpful in my life it's been to have a professional association. Um, one of the easiest ways to find a job is through networking. Sorry, yeah, no, know you're doing this professionally. But um, so having a group of people who understand you that you could you can work with, who know your capabilities, is an incredibly valuable thing. And so UXPA for me has been a wonderful solution because it works at the local level, it works at the international level, and you can go to a monthly meeting and meet people and get put interesting projects together on the side. If you're out of work, you could you could work with folks to say, hey, let's do a volunteer thing together and, and have some impact, put something fresh on my resume. And all those folks are there to really to help. And so there's an infrastructure. And so when I say snuggle up to people who know more, chances are there are people in an organization like that that you can learn from and also mentor others. But it also connects you to lots of folks. And everybody gets laid off at some point or has that big life event that just throws you off course. And, and there are a million things that can happen. But having a group or a, a place you can go to say, look, I'm having a tough time. What would you all suggest? How do we make it happen? Is, is a pretty awesome thing. And you also then, and as we think about things you're willing to sacrifice, I, I don't think of it as sacrifice so much as what would make me not mind driving or what would make me not mind not right. being able to buy that car. Uh, if I was so happy doing what I'm doing, then those other things Our don't, ancillary. you know, maybe it'd be nice, but mm -hmm. it's okay. So if you can put together a project with a group of people as a volunteer and put that on your resume because you're not getting to do what you want to do during the daytime, find a way to shine at it outside. That makes a lot of difference to a hiring manager. Yeah, so, sure. And it, UXPA can really help. So. Yeah, that's great. Randy, I know you're passionate about you know, sacrifice. So you, know, you start your own business. <laughs> people say you got to eat ramen noodles, right? So. Right. I, we talked a little bit earlier about this, the idea that what certainly with every choice you make, other choices then come off the table. And that's part of the sacrifice, and it's, and it's more about what would you be willing to do if, if you couldn't do this, et cetera. The thing we talked about was I see the ramen, and it makes me think about when the timing as to when you make these decisions in your career and in your life. And the idea that when you're married with three children like myself, I might be willing to eat ramen, but are my kids and wife? <laughs> and so there's always timing, and there's always challenges around where you find yourself both professionally and personally, right? Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, sacrifice can take many forms and come at different times. <laughs> well, thank you both for your experience. Um, we only have a few more minutes. I apologize for that, but uh, hopefully you found it to be a good discussion. If anyone has any questions, we have a mic for Randy, Chris, or myself. Everyone's totally happy in their careers. That's yes, awesome. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Precisely. All right, so with that, give it one more minute. Yeah, go ahead. This up here. <laughs> um, at the beginning, you said starting salaries are expected to rise, especially for specialists. Uh, uh -huh. which, which specialists? Uh -huh. Yeah. So yeah. So in general, when we say specialists, you know, we as a as a our research as a part of the Robert Half organization encompasses a lot of disciplines. And so for specialists, we generally are speaking about the professional sector across a variety of industries. Um, as it relates to where we say UX specialists specifically, because I think you saw an increase there. Um, I'll be honest that it's a bit of our research that kind of lumps together like <laughs> a, number of, a number of positions. But what I will say is that anecdotally versus research um, is that you know, there's this dilemma and I get asked all the time, you know, hybrid or deep specialist? Like, what's in more demand, right? And um, I think, you know, clearly, as is the case and has been the case for decades, when there are emerging trends, there's something to be said for the demand for the specialists for that emerging trend. And that will drive compensation and that will drive opportunity. But over time, that specialty, if it becomes pervasive in the industry, becomes expected for everyone. And now all of a sudden, it's a bit more of a better to be a generalist, right? So I don't know if that answers your question. Well, I imagine it depends on what your goal is. Uh huh. So if you want to work for a bigger organization, that would probably be more exactly. deep specialist. You're right? absolutely right. Because you know, really deep specialization will be more common in the largest organizations because there's more demand for that. Whereas in a smaller company, there's more of a demand for someone that can wear many hats. Yeah, great point. 
I would just add, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. You had a question, sir. I just want to say, in can you hear me? Yes. In regards to promotion, one thing uh, I was taught early on when I was writing grants was everyone has to answer to someone. So you're not just making a case to your manager, you're trying to make it easy for him to make the case to his manager uh -huh. to give you a promotion. Yep. So that it's just another level of thinking, but yeah. it, it helps to just keep that in mind. And it's also. not even just your manager's manager. Great point. I had this conversation with someone last week who is kind of pining for a promotion. And I said, the easiest promotions that we make are those where the team to whom this person would report says, well, of course it's Angela. She's already been the leader in the position anyway. So it's, it's make the case to the manager and the manager's manager, but also you know, to the team. It doesn't necessarily have to be direct line responsibility. The team that you would interact with. Make it obvious that you're the best person for the job before you, before you actually have the opportunity. With the caveat, I would say, of if you're really working above your station and, and you're doing a great job, you're also giving the company a deal. Mm -hmm. Right, they're not paying you as right. much, and they're not giving you that title, and you don't get the corner office, and you're doing it anyway. So there, there can come a point where you're like, "Look, I'm doing it." Right, right, and then you've got to speak you really for yourself. You really need to recognize, or uh, right. you know, things are going to change because I've proven I can do it. Yeah. I could do it somewhere else. Yeah, great so, point. Just mm -hmm. a, great point. Good people stay in bad jobs too long. Yeah, so. great. Okay, so uh, if anyone's interested, um, you can certainly follow us on Twitter. We do uh, workplace trends. Um, you can follow our blog at, um, at Creative Group is our Twitter handle, and then we do career resource trends um, on our website. Um, but also we're doing a portfolio review for tomorrow. Um, if anyone also is interested in speaking with a recruiter for information about networking or to review your resume or your social media presence, you can sign up for that uh, in the back of the room, and uh, not in the back of the room, at registration. It's at 10 a.m. tomorrow. Um, but I want to personally thank Chris and Randy for your great insights and expertise. Thanks for and having us. Uh, thank thank you all of you for coming. So thank you. Thank you.